Lighting, composition, and art direction strongly impact the way that your product is perceived, whether that's for a billboard ad or for your portfolio. We're gonna cover some of the best practices of rendering and photography for product design. Shout out to Render Weekly. I used a bunch of their free resources for this video. Their link is in the description. I highly recommend them. I'm using Keyshot for these renderings, so I'll be explaining it from that perspective, but the principles apply to any software package that you end up using. So let's talk about your design first. That's ultimately going to determine what kind of composition and lighting you should use. You need to ask yourself these questions. What is the point of this render and who are you presenting it to? What is the story you're trying to convey? Lighting and composition will create certain moods. The way that you light and compose the image will completely change how it's interpreted. It's going to change that story. So if we look at this rendering versus this one, we have two keyboards here that are very similar designs but with drastically different lighting styles lens focal lengths and compositional choices. Now to be fair, the materials are a little bit different and I think that the designs aren't exactly the same, but I think that's actually secondary to the other three things I mentioned. I think that the other choices are what really separates them. So if we look at Tim's images here, uh, Tim's Zarki, they're very expressive. They might be used in a magazine spread or a billboard to really sell the allure of a product. It's a very emotive rendering. It might also be inspired by more cinematic or experimental lighting choices. He actually managed to make a keyboard feel luxurious and high-end and interesting, not only through good design, but also through the use of composition and lighting. So let's talk about it. First of all, Tim Zarki has chosen to use really harsh shadows here. He did this by creating a very small, singular source of light that was really intense and far away from the subject. It's almost like these were photographs taken outside in early afternoon during really harsh, intense lighting. Most product rendering scenes have at least a couple of lights and reflectors, and they're usually utilizing much softer light. But by having one really strong light source, it creates a lot of contrast. It creates really dark, almost black shadows with really crisp shadow edges. Another thing that Tim has done here is that he's chosen to use a very long focal length. It's almost isometric. And this makes the image appear a bit flatter. You can tell that because the lines here are very parallel. If he used a shorter lens or focal length, these lines would be converging back into perspective a lot more. And because the keyboard is already very geometric and boxy, the longer focal length emphasizes that even more. It makes the image look almost graphical in nature, almost like it's a vector image with blocked in colors. It's very distinctive, almost logo-like or something. Another thing is that there's a tangency in the shadow here. So in this context, when I say tangency, I mean that the line of this shadow and the line of the bottom of the product perfectly sort of line up, they align. This flattens the image a lot, and it makes it appear less three-dimensional, makes it appear more graphical, like I was saying before. Now, normally you should never do that, because we're supposed to be representing three-dimensional objects, but Tim has made it a point to emphasize the graphical nature of these images. So he broke that rule very intentionally in order to make an image that was very striking. If we look at Katarina's renderings, we have a super well-executed rendering that's a little bit more conventional, and that's not a bad thing. The lighting is a little bit softer. Katarina probably used a much softer, bigger light that's closer to the product. This mellows out all of the edges of the shadows. It creates very even lighting. The shadows are less harsh. They're not so dark. She also probably used two or maybe even three light sources. You can tell that because there doesn't seem to be a part of the keyboard that is significantly darker than the other. It's much more subtle. The light coming from the back is probably the strongest because you can see that the shadow is being cast here. But it's generally very even lighting. And Katarina still used a fairly long focal length, probably about 70 to 100 millimeters, whereas most other product photography or renderings, in this case, uses 40 to 55 millimeter lenses. This is for things that sit on a tabletop, you know, obviously things that are bigger require different lenses. The reason for the 40 to 55 millimeter focal length sweet spot is pretty simple. That's sort of how the human eye perceives objects. So 
that's a very common focal length for that reason mostly. By the way, most of you aren't subscribed. You should subscribe. It doesn't hurt you at all. It helps me out a lot. And you know, if you change your mind later, you can always unsubscribe. Back to the video. In this rendering, she completely changed the attitude and feel of the product by having it float above the ground. This makes the rendering a lot less realistic, but it also adds a certain playfulness to it. This is a great example that shows how changing the composition completely changes the attitude and perception of the product, almost as much as the actual industrial design. Really cool stuff. The first image is probably more suited to product packaging. It's very descriptive. It shows you what the product is. It's very matter of fact. It shows you what the product is and what it looks like without really adding any embellishments. This is a good rendering to show on, once again, product packaging or maybe for a design review where you want to be able to easily compare different design details from each other if there's a whole bunch of concepts on the wall or something. The second image is a lot more evocative. It might be more suited to an advertisement to build up excitement about the product. It's less about description and more about sort of conveying an emotion. And there's a whole bunch of really excellent examples of great product photographers and renderers out there. Mark Serre is probably my favorite product photographer. In this image, he's basically managed to elevate a torn piece of foam core to the level of art. And he's got some great product photography work, which we'll talk about in a bit. There's also Man vs. Machine, which does some of the most stunning visuals I've ever seen. Tim Zarkey, Will Gibbons, and Espen Oxholm are all really excellent 3D specialists who focus mostly on product photography. Both Will and Espen have YouTube channels, which I will actually link in the description. They have really, really good tutorials. I highly recommend them. So let's go over lighting now. Basically, a good rule to follow with lighting is that the area of highest contrast, usually the area that's brightest, will command the most attention. That's going to be your first read. So figure out what part of the device you want to highlight in this particular render. If there's a specific feature that makes your product special, you could start by putting visual emphasis on that. Just like there's visual hierarchy in industrial design and the actual design itself, there needs to be that same visual hierarchy in your renderings and product photography. So for this chair designed by Jusian Yang, the photographer, Mark Serre, put a spotlight that highlights the most interesting part of the design, which is the way that these wood pieces wrap around in this sort of spiral shape. In this other image, also photographed by Mark, notice how he emphasizes the front of the lens of this telescope. Then the highlights along the side gradually lead your eye to the back of the device. There's just a little hint of rim lighting for the rear eyepiece and the stand that the device sits on, which helps to separate it from the background. That's essentially what rim lighting is. It's just these little uh, subtle white lines, and that can be achieved by having a light behind the object. You can also use rendering and product photography to communicate an idea for the product. So in these photographs by Nick Baker, or I actually think it was one of his colleagues who did these shots, but, but what's interesting about these is that it clearly shows you what the product does and it sort of makes it feel very playful, right? I mean, essentially what this is is a clock that stretches around anything. And he sort of chose to stretch it around a lot of things that are maybe a little bit ridiculous, but that sort of adds to the whimsy of it. It adds to the playfulness of it. And you know, it's sort of a creative product. So of course it makes sense to photograph it creatively. Okay, so you've seen some examples. Here's how you can actually achieve this in your own work. Now, I think one key thing to keep in mind is that just like other aspects of design, when it comes to lighting and composition, less is more. I've taken this design from the Render Weekly database. This little toy helicopter thing was designed by James Connors. Once again, links are in the description. And I've applied a couple of various materials to this. We've got some tinted glass, we got some matte and glossy plastic, and we've got a little color pop here just sort of mixed in for some variety. So like I said, in terms of lighting and composition, let's keep it simple. One of the most simple ways to get a good composition is to follow the rule of thirds. So basically areas of interest should hit these major intersection points right here. This is not the only way to compose an image not by any means, there are plenty of others, but it is indeed a tried and true method. 
the reality is that when it comes to composition, you're going to have to experiment a lot and try a couple of different things. So we have a basic composition here. Let's start with just one light and let's make the studio environment black. Here's one key thing. If you want to learn about lighting and image composition, look to photography. That's critically important here. So we have our black background here. This is what it looks like when you have a really harsh, tiny light that's really, really far away, almost like the sun, basically. There's more detail. You can see more texture. It's a little bit more aggressive. There's a lot more shadows and contrast. It's a little bit mysterious as the objects sort of blend into the black background. Now, we have another light here that's in the exact same place, but it's bigger. It's a soft light. It's more subdued. You can see more of the product a little bit better. The shadows aren't so harsh. If we move that soft light closer to the object, that effect is emphasized even further. We have a really nice, soft, even lighting. Now, this is usually the preferred method to light a product just because it's sort of easy on the eyes. This is also very common for photographing like portraiture people simply because, you know, it's softer, it doesn't highlight imperfections, it sort of smooths everything out. Now, in addition to the size of the light and how far it is from the subject, there's also different ways you can position it. So, so what we have right now is what is called short lighting. This tends to make objects appear a little bit thinner, and basically the light is positioned sort of further off to the side from the camera. What we also have is broadside lighting. The light is closer to the camera a little bit. It's not quite as much to the side. And what that does is it sort of makes the object appear a little bit larger. It tends to be a little bit less harsh. It tends to maybe not be so flattering. It, it, it sort of makes the object appear a little bit bigger. So with short lighting, the shadows are more prominent, right? Because the darker side of the product is facing more of the camera. Broad lighting implies sort of a lighter, brighter mood. And of course, you know, that kind of makes sense. You can see more of the subject that you're photographing. Another thing is that Broad lighting tends to hide imperfections because the light sort of drowns out all of the, the features. It's hard for me to say whether one is better for another for any given situation. It really just depends on the product that you're lighting. These are just sort of general guidelines. On a more general level, I guess one way to think of it is like short lighting is better if you want something that's a little bit more dramatic and mysterious because you see more shadows and you don't see as much of the object. And broad lighting is maybe better for more illustrative renderings where you want to actually show how something works. But once again, it really depends on the subject matter. Another thing to think about is rim lighting or backlighting. Backlighting just means that the light is basically behind the object. And rim lighting is a little bit more specific where it's creating a rim of light around the edge of the object. So rim lighting is good if you're trying to separate the object from the background. If you want it to basically pop more, it's a little bit higher contrast. You can take out rim lighting if you want the design to feel a little bit more natural because you know most things don't have a rim of light behind them most of the time. And you can combine and mix and match things endlessly. So, you know, I can turn all of these off and turn on one at a time and see what each of them does. I can turn on two at a time. I can turn on three. I can turn on all of them and see what happens. I mean, it's kind of endless what the possibilities are. Another thing that you can do is sort of adjust the intensity of each of them. So maybe you want your short light to be stronger. Maybe you want your broad light to be sort of a soft fill. There's a whole bunch of things that you can try out. and. Once again, it sort of comes down to experimentation. Another thing that you can try, of course, is top lighting. You can move the top light slightly behind the subject or a little bit in front of it, and you can see how that sort of changes it. You can also change the background color. So if we look here, if I make this white, it completely changes the attitude of the rendering. Something that was really kind of harsh and too bright on a black background suddenly sort of looks okay on a white background. So you want to think about that as well. Another thing that I want to talk about is three-point lighting because three-point lighting is a really, really good sort of starting point 
for your light. So you basically have your key light, which is going to be the key light. It, it illuminates the subject the most. And then you have a fill so that the shadows from the key light aren't too harsh. And then you have a backlight to basically separate the subject from the background. It's sort of a tried and true method. If you're not sure how to light a product, it's good to start with this simply because it generally yields at least an acceptable outcome. Another thing that's really important is depth of field. So depth of field is really interesting because once again, it can bring emphasis or a focal point to the product. If you wanna sort of emphasize the front of it or the back of it, it really sort of changes the attitude of the rendering and it sort of gives it that focal point. Light temperature is also really important. So you can change these. Right now they have sort of a bluish hue to them, but you know, you could do something that's maybe a bit warmer. You can change one of the lights to be warmer and the other lights to be cooler. And this is called a warm to cool fade. It's sort of a tried and true method. You can mess around a lot with color. Generally speaking, the more colored lights you add to a scene, the more sort of unnatural and mysterious it's going to seem. It might feel a little bit more exciting and emotional and interesting though. So you just sort of have to balance that out. You have to decide like, okay, what do I wanna communicate with this rendering? You can use the standard Keyshot HDRI and I do it sometimes. Uh, I have found some of them to be useful, but I prefer to use area lights simply because I do have a little bit of a photography background. And to me, it helps me understand the positioning of the lights within the scene better. I can see where each light is. Whereas with the HDRI, it's not always clear where the light is coming from. It, it doesn't really show you where each light is positioned in relation to the product itself, at least as far as I know. If you guys can show me how to do that, let me know in the comments. One thing that's cool about HDRI light pins in Keyshot is that when you make one, you can click on where you want it to highlight the model, and that can be really helpful sometimes. Another thing that's really interesting about them, and I don't know if you can do this with area lights, I could be wrong, is that you can actually uh, change the fall off of the light. So the fall off is essentially the way that the light sort of fades out and dissipates into space. So that can be really helpful as well. And that is one instance where I might use an HDRI light. You can also find a whole bunch of HDRIs online and some of them are really good. I just prefer to do it this way simply because I like to have a little bit more control. I have used HDRIs and there's nothing wrong with them. They're an industry standard. Everybody uses them. Very, very good 3D artists and rendering artists use them. There's nothing wrong with them. I just prefer to do it this way. It's just a preference. And of course, adding a background versus no background definitely affects the feel and look of the product as well. I mean, generally speaking, by adding a background, it makes it feel more realistic because most things don't exist in a pure black background. But once again, it's really just a stylistic choice. If you wanna bring more emphasis to your product, sometimes it makes sense to have it just on a pure white or pure black or some kind of colored background. So anyway, I think that's a good primer on art direction. This stuff is really, really important because it will directly impact the way that people perceive your product. So as always, I hope you guys found this helpful. I hope you learned something. By the way, if you're not subscribed, you should totally subscribe. It helps me out a lot and I'd really appreciate it.